Hey, I love therapy, and in fact, I've been going to therapy since I was around six years old. Though I talk about therapy a lot and may interview some therapists on the show on occasion, nothing that is said in this podcast should be considered a replacement for therapy. If you are struggling, I urge you to please seek guidance from a therapist because you are absolutely worth it. Everyone, you are listening to Wine, Dine, and 69, a podcast about dating, relationships, sex, and self-love. I am your host, Rachel Dalton, and I'm recording this from my office. Um, you know, it's, it's not as uh, fun as it sounds. One, my office has a door that closes, and two, my boss is out to lunch, and three, this uh, intro just isn't going to be particularly salacious, so if you came here for that, uh, you are going to be very disappointed. Um, okay, I'm going to try to keep this intro relatively short because we have a pretty long interview in the second half of this today. Um, today, I interview Abby, and you will find out that that is not her real name, but uh, I interview Abby and we talk about personal development, spiritual growth, um, and I mean, among many other things. Uh, And uh, I wanted to talk very briefly, though, and we mentioned this at the top of the episode, and I know that I touched on it briefly last week. Uh, Abby and I are both from East Lansing, Michigan, where there was another mass shooting um, almost a month ago now on on February 13th. And um, quite honestly, it's been tough. I think about it every day, still. Um, You know, I think about my youngest brother, who is in college, his last year of college, said, like, it's like we joined some, like, fucked up trauma club where, you know, you, I don't know, you, you see it happening in the world, but it sounds bad to say, but you're, like, kind of removed from it because you think, like, oh, well, that couldn't happen to me or that couldn't happen here. And then when it does you think, oh, well, well, like, something has to change, like, something, but you realize that it won't, because it didn't. It didn't after Sandy Hook, and it didn't after uh, January 6th, when literally Republican legislators were um, on the receiving end of of violence. And so if if it's not going to change for those events, it's you know, never say never. I, I want to have hope and I want to push for change. I mean, that's all that we can do at this point. Um, and we must, we must do it. I'm going to put in the episode lo- notes a link to uh, Every Town for Gun Safety. Um, but yeah, it's like once it happens to you, it's not just close to home, it's home. And, you know, I know people who work at MSU. One of my childhood best friends um, from high school, like, her parents live around the corner. My parents, uh, you know, the the shooter was was caught and committed suicide, actually, uh, on the same road that my parents live on, just, you know, miles west. And, uh, yeah, it's, I'm very... I, I knew that my parents weren't at home. They were out of the state, actually. Uh, but I knew my youngest brother had been in East Lansing just earlier that day. He had actually had just been on campus a few hours earlier, I found out later. Um, and, you know, some of these students who were scared for their lives during this M- this attack at MSU were also at Oxford High School, which is... Uh, a suburb of like the metro detroit area um where there was a mass shooting just a year and a half ago some of those students survived that shooting just to go away to college and be faced with more violence i can't imagine how traumatizing that must have been for them um but 
It's been difficult. It was a difficult night. I stayed up um, wanting to see if the the suspect would be apprehended, and he was, rel- like, relatively quickly. I mean, you know, in the context of, of police chases, it was, it was relatively short. Uh, but, you know, three people still lost their lives, and five more were injured. Um... Yeah, it's it's frustrating and it's difficult. And, you know, when the Second Amendment was written, the type of firearms that we had in this country were muskets that took five minutes to reload, not a gun, a semi-automatic that can riddle a human being with bullets within seconds. It's just not the same thing. And people who want to read the Constitution literally... <laughs> I, I don't have words, and I promised myself that I wouldn't make this political, but, like, how how can you not? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to link the link for uh, Every Town Safety in the episode notes, and I'm also going to put um, a link to the Spartan Strong Fund. You can buy a T-shirt that says Spartan Strong, and the, the funds will be, um, I think 100% of them, actually, are, are donated to um, help with the impact that people are facing from this tragic event. Uh, so I'll post both of those in the episode notes, but um, it's been on my mind, and, you know, the world keeps turning, and things keep moving, and there was another mass shooting just like a day later. Um, but it's definitely been on my mind. Other than that, and on a more personal note, my life has um, very much improved since the last time that I recorded an intro. Um, yeah, I just really, you know, took charge of things to improve my life and to improve my mental health and I was um very lucky that I have such a strong supportive base of people you know I my family my friends my wonderful partner you know these are all people who just sat with me in in my frustration and in my sadness and you know they didn't try to fix it um And after, you know, being in some dynamics where I just kind of felt like there was a little bit of like toxic positivity, like, oh, look on the bright side or you should just be grateful and, you know, kind of not wanting to acknowledge um, the fact that like sometimes things just suck. It was really helpful to be surrounded with a group of people who are just willing to validate my feelings and tell me I know this sucks right now. It's really, really shitty but who also were able to say, you can handle this, we know you can do it, we'll be here for you through it, and um, we know that you're going to be okay, you will be okay, things will be okay. That just meant a lot, so I'm very grateful uh, to those people, and a particular shout out to my incredible boyfriend who just really saw like the worst of the worst. Um, and I, I just, there, there are no words. I, I love him so very much and um, am very, very grateful for all of the love and support that he has shown me over the last couple months, which have been <laughs> difficult. Um, yeah, so, so very hashtag blessed, um, hashtag grateful for all the wonderful people in my life and starting to turn a little bit of a corner here, starting to feel more positive about a lot of aspects in my life and uh, just in time for spring, right? (laughs) Uh, Okay, so today I'm going to talk with, like I said, a fellow Michigander, Abby, and you will find out that is not her real name. Um, And we, that's, I think that's one of the last questions that we answer is why she decided to publish this book, Leaving Perfect, anonymously. Um... This is a book about her experience. It's made up of journal entries from when she was a young woman and really faced this kind of identity crisis. She had to take some time to dismantle the version of herself that she was at the time because she realized that it wasn't authentically her. Um, So she dismantled this version of her that, you know, was for other people and then kind of rebuilt Um, a more organically she rebuilt um, to really become you know who she needed to be Uh, it's a story that I myself can relate to a lot I think that many people can 
So we talk about psychology, spirituality, philosophy, religion. It's really uh, everything but the kitchen sink, as they say. I do want to mention just very briefly that um, there is unfortunately some static in this episode. So uh, hopefully it won't be too disruptive. I tried to edit it out as best as possible, but um, we'll see. (laughs) So uh, yeah, always a pleasure to uh, talk to a fellow Michigander. Um, And so without further ado, I'm going to cut to a quick commercial break and then please enjoy my conversation with Abby. Broken, a tragic romance game by Apon Games, is a storytelling game of tragic romance for two players about broken objects and broken hearts. Together, you and your play partner will create two characters in a relationship, and over the course of 10 scenes, you will explore the ways in which the things you loved about each other crack, until everything about your relationship is broken, including 10 real-life physical objects you will break over the game's 10 scenes. In Broken, the relationship will always end. Although the tragic conclusion is inevitable, there is endless potential for healing and self-discovery along the way. Broken is an emotionally deep game that explores themes of memory, identity, and loss. Broken is also full of empathy building, hope, and healing. It recreates the raw, visceral experience of going through a breakup, along with the catharsis of smashing objects, all while telling a beautiful story along the way. Get your copy of the Broken Ebook Edition now by going to bit.ly slash broken game. That's bit.ly slash broken game or head to apongames.com. A P O N games.com today. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am super excited to introduce my guest for this week. Um, It is somebody from my hometown of East Lansing, Michigan, uh, and her name is Abby. Abby, how are you doing today? I'm fine. (laughs) And we should mention off the bat that uh, Abby is not her real name. We are going to be talking about a book that she wrote, um, and it's published anonymously. We will get to that eventually in this interview, but uh, off the bat, I wanted to mention that. Um, But I guess I wanted to, you know, ask first, just because this is in the light of you know, we're, we're from East Lansing. Uh, Michigan State is a big part of East Lansing, and there was a shooting on campus uh, almost a week ago. Um, so, like, h- how are you doing in the face of that? Just a little more of a personal question to get started, but. Well, I mean, it didn't affect me as much as the students, but I know students. Right. Um, so, yeah, and it did. I know the main thing I noticed is I mean, Michigan State is such a sanctuary and so beautiful. And I just thought, wow, it just, you know, I didn't even walk there at all. Mm-hmm. Like I like to go around there because it's just, it feels tainted. But yeah, I does. mean, I don't, I don't feel like I was affected nearly. I can't even imagine the students. Yeah. And um, I know I couldn't go back. I probably wouldn't go back. It's yeah. anyway. Yeah. It's scary. It is. And I mean, MSU features pretty prominently in, in your novel, as does that other school. Um, yeah. <laughs> you have well, I, I, yeah, I took a class and I was in the classroom in the same in Berkey. So yeah, yeah. that same that same hall. Um, well, anyway, I wanted to kind of touch on that just because it would feel weird to kind of ignore it with our mutual right, connection. Right. But uh, you wrote a book called Leaving Perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and congratulations, I read it. It is a beautiful story, um, really raw and vulnerable. Uh, and I related to it quite a bit, actually. Um, but let's start with the title. The book is called Leaving Perfect. And I wanted to kind of give you the opportunity to talk about your relationship with uh, perfectionism and kind of how that has shifted since the events in the book. Well, so perfect. So I was a perfectionist and I still have those traits, but um, I'm trying to think. Perf- I think there's different kinds of perfectionism, right? There's mm-hmm. someone who needs everything to be perfect. Um, there are people who just strive for excellence. But I think the kind of perfectionism that I was dealing with had a lot to- more to do with um, trying to think. I'm I, I'm just going to say this. I'm a writer, so <laughs> 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 I 
can I write it down and then like revise it and then I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> there's a chronic deep-seated perfectionism, which doesn't, in my opinion, have a lot to do with being perfect as much as you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. and striving to be perfect and and the feeling of not being good enough i want to bring in there's a book that relates very much to this story that's in the book um and it's written by alice miller called drama of the gifted child mm -hmm. i don't refer to it in my book because i didn't learn about it till like eight years later okay um but she talks about um when you have a deep-seated feeling that you're not enough and you people will use as a defense trying to be good enough to deny the fact that they already feel like they're not good enough. And so I think perfectionism, what the kind I was experiencing when I wrote the story, had a lot more to do with thinking if you keep, like if you run fast, you know, run as fast as you can and do as well as you can, you're somehow going to be good enough, but it's too late because you already feel like you're not good enough. Mm. So it's very much a defense, I think. Right. Um, I still, but, and I still do have my anal tendencies and I, you know, I need to do well at everything. And some of that is just because that's my personality. Right. And then sometimes too, I just stop and go, just let it go. You're being way too, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so anyway, but, so, but the thing about, at least I don't have the chronic kind, you know, cause that, that was, I didn't even know I was a perfectionist or why or anything at the time. Yeah. And that's how, I mean, chronic perfectionism or striving for perfect sounds absolutely exhausting. Um, but let's kind of talk about the book itself. So it starts off with you at that other school <laughs> U of M, <laughs> and um, you end up leaving. Uh, you end up leaving and moving back in with your uh, parents, first your dad and then your mom. Uh, am I correct on that? Yeah. And yes, yes. well, my mom was not in town. My, the right. place, my room or where I lived was with my, m with my mom and my stepdad. Okay. Um, but they weren't, they were not in town and I didn't tell anyone I was coming home. I just left. Well, yeah. It's like, <laughs> so, it was a yeah. very abrupt, abrupt decision. Yeah. I just walked out. And, uh, so anyway, so I went to see my dad cause he was also in town. Okay. And then it kind of led to, you know, this, year nine nine months to a year of just like intense healing work and growth you ended up going to um a therapist mm -hmm. uh well yes a, a, minister. a minister a counselor mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. a counselor um and you took class a class at msu and you worked and you just really dedicated a lot of time and energy to figuring out what was going on with you um which i can very much relate to um, so that's kind of the overarching view of the book, and we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty, but I did want to uh, touch on some of those things. I think it's important to mention, too, though, none of this was a choice for me. Mm -hmm. I, I just fell apart. In yeah. fact, I thought I was fine. And, and when I started to fall apart, I was just like, this doesn't happen to me. I'm not this person. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so really, I I did all this growth and stuff because I didn't have a choice. That's usually how it happens, right? Like yeah. you, you're back <laughs> up against the wall and something happens. And I it sounded like I... <laughs> so thoughtful, like I was like being enlightened. I'm like, no, I just fell apart. Sometimes, I, that, sometimes that's oftentimes that's what has to happen. Yeah, it's like hitting bottom. Exactly. You have to, it, the only way is up, but you have to do the work to be able to climb right. down the hole. Okay. So one of my favorite uh, lines in the book is something that Michael, your uh, minister and person who was acting as your counselor says, which is philosophy is basically a religion for atheists. And that's kind of the through line of the entire book is the link to spirituality you come into this growth journey from the viewpoint of a philosopher but by the end you realize that maybe psychology spirituality and philosophy are are all related um so kind of walk me through that what was that like for you okay so well so when i started i was an atheist um and michael knew that he didn't care and in fact, our whole relationship was not about religion at all. It was about healing. Um, and then I noticed, so as I started 
peeling away like all the things that were false that I had taken in to try to be what I thought I had to be. Um, I just started opening up inside and I started having feelings that were, were spiritual. Um, intellectually, I still resisted because I thought, I thought religion was like magical and not tied to anything real and um, like fantasy thinking, you know, everything will be better when we go to heaven. And, um, but I started having feelings and, and of course, Michael was religious, so he would support, you know, anything like that. Anyway, the, the, the first feeling I remember of having that was spiritual um, is it was, there's two halves of the book. The first half, I'm just taking everything apart and trying to figure out who I am. And the second half, or taking everything apart that I'm not. And then the second half, I'm trying to figure out, so who am I underneath all this stuff that I thought yeah. I should be? A dismantling and a rebuilding. Yes, yes. Um, and I was sitting in a park. I was very estranged from my old life. Um, my friends, I didn't feel close to anymore. And I was sitting outside and the sun was setting and I'd been walking in a park. Um, there are people there and, and in the scene, I'm noticing they all just seem to have like a purpose, you know, and they belong. And I thought, who? I don't even know where I belong anymore. And the sun was setting and all of a sudden the sun, it just felt like a presence to me, like healing loving and I just cried and I could let go of everything and I didn't feel alone. And that's what mm -hmm. I would call a spiritual feeling. And in, in fact, in the book I write, I could almost say it almost felt spiritual, but I don't believe in God yet. Right. And so I, these things started opening up inside of me and, and I, and I am a spiritual person. So I, so maybe not everyone would have that feeling, but I was, cause that was part of who I, who I am. Um, I think it was a lot, I've been in a lot of 12 step meetings, especially in my 20s. And, you know, that feeling of you hit bottom and then you surrender and then mm -hmm. you get in touch with like a higher power. So I didn't know that language, higher power, but I would have probably been OK with it. And yeah, so, yeah, those feelings were coming. And then. And I guess to talk about the evolution of that, there was a point even in the second part, there's a lot of struggle through the whole book, because by the end of the book, I just have a foundation, you know, it's not like I've figured everything out. I mean, it was right, a pretty right. short period of time to put my whole life together. <laughs> and, um, but at one point I'm struggling again and I'm writing and I feel like I want to write to someone, but I can't write dear God. So I write mm -hmm. dear Jorge. <laughs> just, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, cause I'm like, I can't write to God. And then, but then as, so I start, just things start getting better. I start feeling myself more, start opening up. I start feeling joy and all these things that just are buried when you're like suppressing big parts of yourself. And, and then like one point I noticed, like I started feeling thankful, right. And wanting to bless people. And I'm just like, what is this? <laughs> the book is, um, is based on my diary entries and it's mm -hmm. true. But it's there's a lot of development, but I stuck pretty close to like there's a lot of scenes in the book or diary entries that I didn't actually write that, but I wrote them like what would have I have written? Right, because like um, I, because my diary wasn't conveniently have all the details right because I was writing it for myself, but the, right. pretty close. But there's one thing my um, Michael gave me a book, a spiritual book, and I, in the book that I wrote, it's mysticism, and. That's yes. not actually the book he gave me. I actually talked to him. He didn't remember. I couldn't remember. <laughs> but it was, oh. a, it was a spiritual book. So I thought, okay, I, so it was, it's, this is the most changed thing probably in the whole book. It's completely false. But, I've, okay. but, I, but, the, po but the point of the book wasn't what the book said. It was when I read it because it was a spiritual book. I started feeling like I actually believe this stuff. Like, mm -hmm. and so I, I guess what it was, it was just like things were opening up in me and it wasn't about religion. It was about spirituality. And of course, whenever I would tell Michael anything like that, he goes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and he would, and he said at the end, you know, he goes, I need, this is just a spiritual crisis. You know, mm -hmm. he goes, I knew the, from the very beginning, that's what this was. So. 
Yeah. And anyway. it's funny. I always say, like, you know, I believe in the job description, not necessarily the title. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also feel weird, you know, using the term God because it reminds me so much of, like, you know, growing up with going to church and Sunday school and all of that stuff. But I've kind of settled on on universe because for me and – as I know is, was the case for you, being outside in nature, walking in nature, taking it in really is like my church. Oh, yeah. So I think that like universe is kind of the, the term that I feel most comfortable with. I feel like I do have to ask you too, have you watched uh, The Good Place? No, I have watched it, but I don't watch a lot of sitcoms. So, but yeah, yeah I've I don't seen either. it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't watch a lot of sitcoms either, but that one was one that, for whatever reason, um, has captured my heart. Uh -huh. I love it so much. It's so, so good. Um, well, talk to me about – we kind of talked about how the first half of the book is dismantling. The second half of the book is kind of a rebuilding process. Now, this happened slowly. How did you maintain hope throughout all of these different steps of this incremental change? Well – a lot of it was seeing Michael every week because mm -hmm. he, I mean, I would just go, I could go and cry. I would go, he was so accepting and he was like this, like thing I was clinging to. Right. Um, Cause I always felt safe in, in his presence. I felt heard. Um, and he, he gave me a book early on. There's a lot of books I reference um, books. I use books still you know, I just feel that they're part of our support system, absolutely. Um, which is partly what motivated me to write a book, just to try to help, you know, be helpful if it could be helpful. Um, but he gave me a book called Enjoy Breaks Through fairly early in the process. Mm -hmm. And it lays out, it reminds me a lot of drama of the gifted child. It talked about what I was going through, self-hatred, how that leads to depression, and also, it was not a, a diary or a memoir, but a therapist wrote about it, but he wrote up specifically about a client he worked with. And she got better. And I would just cling to that. Like, okay, there's an end. Like, you can get better. So I just hung on to every bit of belief that whatever it was I was going through wasn't going to be my whole life. But I had to do the work. Yeah, and I love that books could be like that source of comfort for you too. Oh yeah, I was, I just, I mean, I really hung on to books because you can't always like, when you're going through something like that, you're not running around finding people to talk to because you don't want to tell anyone because mm -hmm. you're like such a mess, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I didn't have a support system of people who talked about their feelings because that wasn't who I was. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but so you could find a book. Right. And they don't know you and they're going to just be there for you. <laughs> so, yeah. Without so, even knowing. It. Yeah. Yeah. And so but I think that book, especially because it just it explained what I was going through. And it's like and then she got better. So I'm like, oh, I can get better, too. Yeah. And, you know, talking about like uh, your support network and the people that you surrounded yourself with, um, considering how people think about you. And that kind of ties into self-confidence. Those are kind of big themes in the beginning of the book because really like the catalyst, um, it seems like for you leaving U of M was being a part of a sorority that just didn't bring you joy and made you like really question things about yourself. Yeah, although the catalyst actually, well, be I had a boyfriend for two years when I was mm -hmm. at school and he was actually a very... He was the nicest person and he, I was myself with him and he was very accepting. He just, I couldn't even say how nice he was, right? Loving, accepting. Mm -hmm. He was a safe person for me and I could say anything to him. And, but I knew I wouldn't marry him and I broke up with him. And that was the catalyst because I lost my safe person. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, and, then, and so the yeah. sorority, yeah, the sorority was like this place I had joined. It was just part of making decisions that had nothing to do with who I was. And right. so I was alienated there. Yeah, and then when I lost my safe person, I just felt just completely alienated from where I was. 
Well, it's like he was your he was like your life vest, and you lost your life vest. Yeah, and in fact, I you know I broke up with him, and then I kept going back to him. And there, the temptation was, you know, in the beginning, it's like, well, maybe if we just get back together, all this will stop. You know, all this. Like, <laughs> yeah, I get that. I and then I'm like, no, you're not going to get out of this. Um, no, that's, yeah. that's not how, not how it works. So, Unfortunately, yeah, it would be nice. But I did. But no. and, and he was so nice. He kept seeing me and he would be there. And I'd broken up with him. This is how nice this person was. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. You touch on... You, talk, you were just talking about a very nice person, but you do touch on anger quite a bit in regards to multiple different people. I mean, and this includes your parents. This includes just random people that you run into. This includes this boyfriend. Right. Um, and it includes Michael. Um, talk to me about anger and how it can actually be a really useful emotion. Well, yeah. So anger for me was because I was so shut down. So anger, when you start waking up, it takes a sort of like oomph, right? And so sometimes it has to come out as anger. Like, I believe when you're really, really empowered, you don't really need to be angry because you have energy and power. But when you're powerless and you feel weak, sometimes the only way you can like burst forth is it comes out as anger. I guess that's the best way to say it. I had an interesting experience. I had, I had known a woman... Um, in my in the 80s that when I started going to 12-step meetings who was extremely depressed very mm -hmm. like almost flat affect and I remember it was several years later in another context I ran into her and she was she had had a lot of therapy she got in touch with a lot of things she'd had a really really abusive childhood and oh. she was kind of like loud and raging all the time. <laughs> I know and, the type of person. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, I thought, and it was, and I had known her when she was almost flat. And I thought mm -hmm. she's getting in touch with this stuff. Right. But she was so alive. She was not flat and she wasn't mean or bitchy. She just, it was like, everything was just bursting out of her. So I was, I think I was trying to fight against all the things that, you know, were hard for me to, to, to question. And a lot of it came out as anger because I needed the courage. Yeah, I totally get that. And it's, it's once you have that, it opens doors for understanding, but you have to kind of work through that anger first, right? Eventually, you know, you become empowered and then you're, you're just strong, but you don't have to be angry because you're like, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm entitled to be this way and I can be strong. But when you're depressed and powerless and you feel self-doubt, sometimes it just comes out as anger. Yeah, no, totally. I get, I get that. And that's, I mean, anger is a emotion that it usually has more to do with what's happening inside, right? Yeah. And, you know, okay, this, I don't want to, I get very, I don't like to talk about my beliefs like because they're mine, but mm -hmm. I, I read a lot of metaphysics. And I'm, I'm connecting this a little to the, the a active shooter and, and well, the whole tendency we have. And a lot of these people are very, very unhappy. And I know some of the metaphysical, you know, things I've read is that violence is, is it's un people are unempowered. And when people feel empowered and strong and good, they still have that same energy, but they, it just won't come out that way. You know, that violence is not natural to people. And right. it's, it's like anger because that's the only way it comes out. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, no, it's. Yeah. And I believe yeah. that because the more I have become like when something goes wrong, you know, just in my life and I can still, I'm a hothead, you know, I'd be like, but a lot <laughs> of times I feel like, Hey, I can address this. And sometimes I might react angrily in the moment, but I don't like do it, to, you know, but then I just say, Hey, you can deal with this and I can go in calmly as an adult and just address it without having to get angry. But I couldn't do that. You know, then I was just fighting to be myself. Yeah. When you're fighting just to survive, essentially, it's difficult to process. Emotions yeah. And I didn't feel way. empowered, like, you know, at mm -hmm. all. So I felt like I had to fight because I didn't feel just like I could say, yeah, this is who I am. So I was always right. fighting to be who I am. And I guess that kind of brings me to a question that I was hesitant to ask, but 
it's part of the book. So I was like, all right, I'm going to ask it. Um, you touch on your relationship with your parents in the book and how that impacted your perfectionism. Um, and you know, I'm not going to go into details about that, but what was facing that like? I was what? This is, I, I, I get very hesitant to, to talk critically about my parents. Totally. Um, and I, yeah. In yeah. fact, I, my dad wanted to read the book and I thought, I don't want him to read the book because I had a better yeah. relationship with him. Than, you know? And, uh, you know, and I thought, I don't want you to feel bad because that was a long time ago. But yeah, yeah, I, I was what my parents, I was a good child. I was successful. And my parents were, they both came from very deprived households, I guess. Right. Um, and they were needy. And I was, so I met their needs, right? Which is really like the opposite of the way it's supposed to be. Yep. <laughs> and, but it, it's like, they didn't know any better. They were so well-meaning, but they were needy. And I was what they wanted to be. And like I write in there, my mother is from this very successful family and she wasn't like a big achiever herself, but they were like super successful people and professionals. Mm -hmm. And so here I was smart, right? I mean, I'm, I was smart. I, I succeeded. I did well. And boy, oh boy, that was something she could go, look what I have, right? Look what I produced. <laughs> and yeah. so there was a lot at stake for them, for me to be successful. It made them feel good. And so, so I was, you know, and that's, so I got strokes for that. So I did it because that's how I got positive, you know, instead of just saying, well, I'm just me and I'm, they love me no matter what. I mean, I think they meant to, but they, they got more out of me when I was what they wanted me to be. So mm -hmm. if that, anyway, so, which was successful and doing well and all that. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, none of us escape childhood un completely unscathed. Um, you know, we're, we're being raised by human beings who have their own things that they're going through and their own self-image or self-worth you know, things that they're struggling with. And I think that that's uh, always important to remember when, you know, thinking about parents. Yeah. Well, and they were, they weren't really people to like go to therapy and like mm -hmm. dig through all their stuff. And they were right. very young when they had me. So, but they, they're not people who like work on their stuff. Like I can talk about my father because he passed recently. So oh, I'm, I'm not, so sorry. Yeah. Um, but he, um, even I remember, like, I ended up having a much better relationship because he wanted to be a good father and he just didn't yeah. know. He just struggled even with self-insight. He would call me up and he'd talk about, like, like I'm very introspective and I have what's a guy called Howard Gardner, who's an educational psychologist, mm. calls um, intrapersonal intelligence. Like, you, you just can, like, I'm really good at doing therapy because I just mm -hmm. can look within and have self-insight. And... Um, he was like, how do you do that? Like he just, you know, so, so he didn't have the ability to work through his stuff. And then, so it just kind of got passed down to me, but yeah. you know, it wasn't his fault. He just didn't, it was just, he didn't know. And there's a generational thing at play here too, right? Therapy wasn't, I feel like widely accepted. I feel like everybody that I know goes to therapy now. Right, yeah, rightly so. <laughs> but I think it was honestly my parents. I don't think it's their thing, yeah. right? They're not philosophers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I can understand. I mean, well, that kind of brings me, this just, we're segueing perfectly. Um, it kind of brings me to, I've been thinking a lot that there are some people in life who just want to live right they want to go to work they want to make money they want to enjoy living they want to be in the moment they want to be present um they're content with what they have and they don't seem to ask these big abstract questions like you and i do big right <laughs> yeah like then there are people like us who want to understand the meaning and the full range of emotions that they're experiencing and you say in um on page 89 of your book you say why am I here? Why do I want to know so badly? Why can't I just live like everybody else? And um, you you even mention later in the book that you start getting frustrated with people who who don't see the world that way. Um, and I guess I'm wondering like what you think about that idea that there are different people that interact like that and how how we can, you know, 
interact together to understand one another a little bit better. Yeah, now I just think we'll have different agendas. Um, mm -hmm. And I've kind of, I still, honestly, I mean, so many times I just think I'm just so weird compared to other people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like super, you know, contemplative and, but. You're it, an artist. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, and I'm like, okay, that's just, and, but not everyone's like that. Sometimes I just think, hey, that, what would that be like, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but anyway, I want to, this is where I want would like to read something. It's, sure, absolutely. It's, it's, there's a, a person named Jane Roberts who wrote a bunch of books that she channeled called The Seth Material. Anyone who, have you heard of him or any of that? I haven't. No. Oh my gosh, yeah. Anyone, well, it's, she died in, in 1984. So I mean, okay. this is old. But yeah, very highly respected. Anyone who accepts these kinds of things, right? She's very credible and channeled okay. all these books. And she wrote where, again, I don't want to try to tell anyone this is real or not, because I don't try to convince anyone of anything. But mm -hmm. supposedly, she tuned into William James, like his energy now, you know. Okay. And I had seen an excerpt of it, which I loved. And then I bought the book. But this is actually the excerpt I saw in a, they had a journal from like the set with the Seth material. And he talked about, and when I read it, I was like, yes. But he talked about there are some people, like they kind of just live in their times and they don't question things a lot, right? He's talking in terms yes. of the times, people who are, they do what's typical, right? Like they're on social media or they just do, they do things that so they don't stick out and they're not weird, right? <laughs> and then he wrote, but if a person's mind is given to philosophy, if the heart questions the head and the head the heart, if the person seeks the answers to questions that rise like smoke from the fire of daily life, if the mind and heart alike are united in their untiring search for what comes before and what comes after, then there is no recourse but to stand somewhat apart from the time. Mm. And he says, there is no recourse but to steadfastly refuse to concentrate upon the daily details that others find so fascinating. For such persons see alike life's flaming patterns and the ghostly ashes left behind. Said the answers must come from another level that gives meaning to life's daily contest. So the questioner treads a careful line of attending to life and not attending at the same time. But when I read that, I was like, yeah, I'm like kind of person. You know? mm -hmm. And anyway, yeah, I bought the book. I mean, I'm like, I still look at it sometimes. I'm just like, some people are like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm like that too. I mean, I think that uh, Abraham Hicks, I don't know if you've heard of. Oh yeah. I read almost all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's, who I'm, that's who I'm more familiar with in terms of like, you know, channel messaging and everything. Right, right. Um, and I, I love that stuff. Um, and I, I love that you're, you're just so curious, right? Like you, you say, you're like, you're like, I don't know. Like, I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to convince anybody, you know, I'm figuring it out myself you know, but I, I love that you have this curiosity. Well, yeah, I do. Um, I do have definite beliefs. It's just that I really, really don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like, like I need to convince other people. Yeah. Like, it's like that. It, well, at the end of my book where I talk about truth is subjective and people have different truths. It's like, mm -hmm. I do believe everything I believe, but I don't believe other people should believe it. Like maybe it's not right yeah. for them. But it doesn't mean yeah. I don't believe it. That's, you know. Right. So that's why I feel really weird when I talk about stuff. Because I'm like. I don't want to <laughs> proselytize. Or no, I mean, and yeah. hey, here, like the beauty of this is that you're here to talk about your beliefs. You're here to talk yeah. about your book. Like you're here to talk about you. So uh, you're not proselytizing. People are tuning in willingly. Um, well, I, I, I wanted to kind of talk, you know, now that we're talking about like the books that have influenced you, there are a couple that you mention. Um, the Death of Ivan Illich by Tolstoy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then um, The Plague by Camus. And this is <laughs> this is actually the part of the book when you were discussing these two pieces of writing where I was like, oh, she's like starting to get it. Like she's, I, I, it's like where I really felt a shift. Um, and I'm going to see if I can go to page nine. Yeah, page 90. So in for The Death of Ivan Illich, um, it's about a man who basically avoids, 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 avoids. And then at the end realizes that what was missing the entire time was people. 
Well, he had not so much avoids, but he was like, he was so, he was one of those people who's like, was, would be in the status, right? And how much he has and how impressive he is and how much money he has. And, he, but yeah, he doesn't, he thinks those things are important. And, and, yeah. and then the things that are, you call like relationships or just deep things, you know, spirituality don't don't have external value or may not look that so he didn't he dismissed them and then at the end of his life realized that he had it wrong all along yeah and again this is a book i read because it was part of a class so it's not mm-hmm. one of the books i just read for myself um because i was taking a philosophy of literature class mm-hmm. and so but so i i i i don't have the book with me but he had like uh, I, some kind of manservant or something, you know, someone from a different class as mm-hmm. he was dying. And he realized the guy is just good, you know, and he starts seeing like, he starts shifting his perception. And that's what I was doing in the whole book, you know, is like what matters and, and what I thought mattered, you know, I decided really doesn't. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So I related to that, except at the time I was, reading this book, it was just disturbing me because I was like, oh my God, that's how I am. <laughs> it's like, well, he says, like, like, ah. like, the instructor says, you know, he left out people because people are messy. And I'm like, yes, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm like, and then I, and I, because I almost have the book memorized sometimes, but you know, it's like, how am I going to not end up like Yvonne, you know? Yeah, no, so, I totally get but, it. Yeah, so it was kind of terrifying when I read it because it was like seeing myself. And just going, oh my God, I just wanted to run out of the class and scream. Yeah, that same idea. That same idea is kind of um, the, the idea of at least uh, not not necessarily avoiding, but yeah, I guess like in the plague, which you talk about like literally on the next page, um, and that's about townspeople, you know, hearing about the plague, not they don't believe it at first and then it's when it starts affecting people more directly they go oh shit like you know well, and it's like the upper class people right so they mm-hmm. think they're just like they don't have problems they're like the upper class mm-hmm. yeah and then all of a sudden they realize it's like covid you know it gets everybody you know yep. but they think they're immune to like ugliness and difficulty mm-hmm. because they're you know and then it just it takes them to their knees and they're just down there just like every other person Yep, trying to figure it out. Yeah, just, it's like, you, like don't, the rest of yeah, us. you don't escape the mess, you know. But mm-hmm. some people can try to pretend that they can. And you can probably yeah. get away with it until something happens. <laughs> exactly. And, I mean, these two moments, when you mention these two books on page 90 and 91 of, of your book, um, are definitely the moments where I was like, ah, okay, like this is, this is the, heart of, the heart of the matter. That's so interesting. Yeah, because people react differently. I've never had anyone react that way. So it's interesting. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's definitely, it, it was definitely a cool moment. And it made me want to, you know, read those. I, I haven't read either of them. So uh, just add them onto my ever expanding yeah. Goodreads list, I suppose. <laughs> well, let's kind of talk about uh, going back to spirituality. There are many scenes in which you have a eureka moment that occur when you're in nature you kind of talked about that moment Mm -hmm. earlier when the sun is setting in that park and your former stepmother gail um who was i mean i it's weird to say character because it's a real person right right but she she was a, a character that i absolutely loved she is a great teacher um of enjoying and being present and really drinking in nature Mm -hmm. um and we've kind of touched on this already but i kind of want to like really focus in on it right now what is that link for you between nature and spirituality mental health um etc for you well well one thing you know the healing aspects of nature and its relationship to spirituality have been so documented it's not something i like um, you know i think about but i know it's you know there's all kinds of information about its effect um Mm -hmm. for me I think nature has no opinions, right? (laughs) It's not Mm -hmm. trying to do anything. It's not, I mean, unless you're in a sculpted garden, you know, it's just, it just is. And I think, so when I'm sitting in nature and it's quiet and I'm an introvert, so I like that, you know, the sounds, Um, but there's a peace, right? It's not, 
I mean, there is nature, you know, there's like storms and which, you know, we don't see a lot of that or I don't here in, in Michigan. We don't get like mm-hmm. the real disaster. But I mean, it can be powerful and intense and scary. But, you know, if you're sitting out, you know, and it's sunny and you're by a lake or something, it's just, it's incredibly peaceful. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, I find I'm very sensitive to like negative energy and, and I'm impressionable even still, you know, and sometimes I just have to get away from people to go like, what do I really think? And, you know, when you're <laughs> in nature, you don't have anything like that, right? There's no pressure. There's just no one's, there's no to-do list, you know, there's no impressiveness, right? Nature's not going, oh, look at me, you know, <laughs> right, I'm right. a better tree than that tree. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very, yeah, I just think it's healing and it's beautiful. You know, I mean, it is. and there's so many, I mean, Michigan is, has a lot of trees and things, but you know, there's just beautiful, you know, mountains and oceans and anyway. Yeah. And I think if you do, when I, first time I ever went out West in my twenties, I mean, I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, it's, it's huge out there. Or you go to a waterfall, and it can also just remind you of your place, you know? Mm, that's what I was going to say. It reminds you of how insignificant you are in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, but like which not in a bad way. In a way. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and just that you're part of something bigger. And it, it helps, for me, it helps my brain to quiet down because it's just like, all right, like you are part of a, a, a small piece in a bigger puzzle. Right. Well, another thing that kind of came into play over the course of the book was you did a lot of people watching and you did this, you know, you would do it on Green River, um, which is the main stretch of, of the road in East Lansing mm-hmm. at different, you know, bars or cafes. And you also did it um, riding the bus. What were some lessons that you learned from watching other people during this time in your life? Well, I think I just, I just, I'm a people watcher, but I think, so and I'm not sure it was always lessons but I, I would like to talk about the bus, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I still like riding the bus sometimes. <laughs> I have a car. You know? But um, so I was from an upper middle class, right? High achiever, right? That whole thing that I was mm-hmm. trying to go like, like, you know, you can be and even like, you know, with the belief of like, you know, you're superior, you know, you're, you're smart, you're. And on the bus, it's just regular people. There was no pretense there. Um, and I probably, I mean, I can romanticize that. Because I just felt like it was regular people. And when I was on the bus, I could feel just like being a regular person and I didn't have to be mm-hmm. anything. Kind of similar to that nature feeling, right? Yeah, it was. It was just, you're just out amongst the regular people. Because I was from a world where people just, they're impressive and they just think they're like hot stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and aren't I so smart? And look at, you know, I make all this money and, you know, and I'm just like, on the bus, you just, just people on the bus. And it's a lot, it's a lot of working class people, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it made me feel just, it freed me from that pressure. Like I'm supposed to be something or do something or be impressive. Which was so vital at this period. Yeah, it just, yeah, it just, and it was out of my environment. So like I write in there on the bus, my mind is free to, you know, think what it wants. There's no rule. And just the feeling of like, people are just trying to get by. So they're not all caught up in all that stuff. No, absolutely. Um, It's, again, it's that survival idea, right? People are just trying to survive. Yeah. And yeah. So anyway, I just, I don't know. And I, I, I don't know. I still like riding the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I haven't ridden the bus in a while. I mean, I'm I'm here in Philly, right, where, like, you know, I could jump on the bus at the corner in 10 minutes if I needed to. But, uh, you know, I do I do remember uh, riding – Was is it Cata? Oh, yeah. Still Cata. Cata? Okay. Yeah, it's still Cata. Um, I remember riding that, like, to work when I used to work at Best Buy. And it really is very interesting um, seeing the type of people just – observing people going about their normal day and you kind of create little stories about you know where they might be going or who they might be seeing and um again it gets it gets you out of your head yeah uh well let's kind of talk about 
There are some different nuances uh, between – this is a question I've been asking myself a lot because as somebody who str- struggles with anxiety, um, I've been asking myself – and you seem you know, like a person who this would be a good person to ask this question to. What do you think about the nuances between gut instinct versus anxiety versus intuition? Gut instinct and intuition, I'm not sure how I would differentiate those. Yeah. Unless gut instinct is like a quick thing. But for me, anxiety, the way I experience anxiety, well, I guess, so my whole, my conditioning, which is still very deep in me, it's like, it's not like it's gone, Mm -hmm. is, you know, to be, to be like other people, not to be weird, you know, (laughs) Um, to fit in, to, to do well, all that stuff is still runs pretty deep um but and then a lot of times i get intuitions that are completely i guess out of the norm you know Mm -hmm. unusual like when i read like a lightning bolt yeah no not like like the way i am like it's Mm, a deep okay like um here's an example well like public like writing this book i mean i had tremendous anxiety when I started writing, because I'm like, why do I want to write this book? This is such a weird book. It's based on your journal entries. Why do you want to do this? Nobody does this except Anne Frank, right? <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, you're just this weird person. Why, you know, and who do you think you are? And so I get intuitions that feel true, but they counter all my conditioning. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is it gives me anxiety because, yeah. because it ter- like my own self will terrify me. Because I'll get an idea and it'll be very deeply intuitive and it'll feel right, but it contradicts everything I've known. And so then I'm all freaked out about it till I can integrate it. So, and I've just like one time, I don't want to have specifics, but I had a very deep intuition about something Mm -hmm. and I followed it and it just, I don't, I get intuitions that come to me, you know, and some of them, I just wait to see if they're going to have traction, you know, because I get ideas all the time and. But this one, it was very unorthodox. That's all I'll say. Wasn't illegal, you know. <laughs> but um, and I trusted it. <laughs> but it countered so many things, and it triggered such a deep level of anxiety. I kept thinking I was going to be killed, oh, and I wow, even okay. knew. I'm like, I'm not going to be killed. <laughs> you know? like, I don't live in that kind of world. And um, anyway, what happened? It was actually. But it was an example of how sometimes I'll follow something because I'm like, it's my intuition. And I know this is right. Um, but it can trigger something because of my conditioning. Because I think my deeper self and basically a lot of my conditioning, they just don't match. And I think mm-hmm. that's what why mm-hmm. I fell apart. Because, you know, it didn't match me. And it was like this big split. Yeah, the stuff that fall, wasn't me. Yeah, fall. I think my real self just was like, "We're coming through, baby." <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but it came through like in a very difficult way. But um, so anyway, in fact, the, the when I had the the fear reaction, this is getting into metaphysics again. But I ended up I worked with a therapist. I worked with a, an actual psychologist for many many years, um, mm-hmm. and he I actually went to him because I'm like I have to deal with my psychology. And because I saw a minister and I saw a very metaphysical counselor after that, because I didn't trust psychologists, as I say in the book. Right. I was mm-hmm. worried they were going to, like, lock me up or something. Right. And because uh, I was so neurotic. And so anyway, and then it ended up that I found out this person was very metaphysical. Which, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, which does happen. <laughs> there are plenty like, of, I don't think that's yeah. a coincidence. But, yeah. But anyway, right so I, I went, I was just losing it. And I actually ended up having like a spontaneous past life regression where I was killed. <laughs> oh my gosh. And wow. so, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's why. But, but I guess what I'm saying is, so yeah, anxiety to me is because I scare myself because I still worry about what people think or how it looks or mm-hmm. there's something wrong with me. And I guess that's where a lot of it comes from, in my opinion, for me. That's, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I appreciate that well thought out answer. Um, just something I've, but I've asked a few guests this. I'm like, hey, like, what's your experience with this? So um, well, we're going to start wrapping up here. I have a few last questions. Um, you end the book or you kind of start wrapping up the book by starting to volunteer 
at an organization called The Listening Ear, um, where you kind of start to realize that maybe you're not as weird as you thought, that there are plenty of other people who, you know, want to talk openly about their feelings and want to support other people in expressing their feelings. Um, how did that help in those, you know, final stages, not in healing, but like, you know, before you ended up, you know, stopping. Oh, it was like having a meeting with my I was like, mm -hmm. well, and like, there's this one line in the book and this is, um, well, it was actually someone who became a friend of mine and I took it out of context. So I say it happened in a training, but he, he said this to me once we, we were talking about what we like to do. And he goes, I like to, I like to have an interaction with someone that I go home and I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> and when he yeah. said that, I thought, I would never say that to someone because it just sounds so weird. <laughs> it was like nobody in my whole family or anyone I had ever known in my life would say such a thing. And he just said it like, but anyway, so what I, I guess what I'm saying is there were people like that. Like they just mm -hmm. thought about things. And I just, I can't begin to explain. I had no people like that in my whole life mm -hmm. at all. Nobody was reflective, philosophical, seeking. And except there's one person that was, I knew very indirectly. Um, and then my stepmom, she was, I could tell she was like that. But yeah. um, so anyway, yeah, it was like finding people that like, they, they talk my language. Yeah. And that's what I would take away from it too. I mean, that's what I did take away reading about it. You were just like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not as weird as I thought. I'm not alone. There are plenty of people, you know, like me. Yeah. It's like, like in the, I talk about, I had gone to it. Because I had always wanted to do it, not not for that reason. I had always thought it'd be interesting, um, but I never could volunteer there because I was going to school in Ann Arbor. Right. right. Um, but when I went to the train, I actually went to a, an orientation to sign up right when I came home from U of M when I was like a complete mess, and mm -hmm. I was very good at, you know, I could look like I was fine because I was good at that. So I went through and like, I'm just falling apart, but I'm like acting all calm. And then the woman, in fact, there's a scene where they, you know, have us talk about feelings. And I just started working with Michael so I could say all the right words, but it was so mm -hmm. fake because I was really a mess. But the woman, this woman gets up and she says, if anyone's having a crisis, you know, maybe don't volunteer now. And just right. the way she said it, like, it's just a thing people have happened because I really mm -hmm. thought like I was just, something was wrong with me. You know, because in my family, you just didn't fall apart, you know, you just, <laughs> and, and it was like, wow, they just think like, like falling apart is part of growth. Just like my yeah. minister saying, yeah, it was a spiritual crisis. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I'm like, you mean I'm not like mentally ill? Because <laughs> that's what I was afraid of. I'm like, what's happening to my mind? You know? <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it was just people, you know, when you find your people, right? <laughs> yep. No, 100%. Yeah. Well, yeah. you, so there is a, like we mentioned, you know, we are calling you Abby. That's mm -hmm. what the name that you use in the book, uh, not your real name and not the name that you are published under. Uh, but, you know, I kind of want to take a second to talk about uh, why you chose, you have an article on your website for the book, you know, that says why anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, but just take a second to kind of talk about that decision. Well, I'll, so yeah, and I wrote why anonymous on my website, because I actually don't feel like I wrote some kind of scandalous book. And if I really, really deeply needed to be anonymous, I would not be doing the podcast. Because right. yeah, my voice is pretty distinctive. And I haven't said anything too revealing. So it's not so much that I'm hiding my identity, but what I found when I, I worked on the book for a long time and I didn't think about publishing. And when I turned toward publishing, I felt like I would stepped into some surreal place where I had to like impress people again and sell mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, and I also felt like there's this real pressure on authors like to be almost celebrities. And I think we do, we have like a cult of celebrity in our culture. Definitely. And I thought, I wrote this book and it's like an offering. Like, I don't want to, you know, I want people to read it who maybe need it, but I, I can't sell myself. And mm -hmm. also making, it, it got so bad because I thought I have to make a big deal of myself. 
<laughs> this is like the thing that I spent years trying to not need to do. And it got so bad, I actually went back to therapy because it was pushing mm, my buttons. Okay. And this is kind mm -hmm. of a funny story, but I was, I, when I was tweaking the final, I was making sure all the dates matched up in the book as I was finishing it up. And, and as I was working on it, and this is right about the time I then was going to turn toward publishing, I thought, I don't really relate to the person I was in the book anymore because I just wasn't so terrified. And all of a sudden, all that stuff got tripped off. And I was back in therapy and I'm like, ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was one of my next questions was how you've differed. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. So what I'd done because I hadn't, I hadn't been pushing those buttons. Right. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, but, um, so what happened, so I went and I, I kept trying to, to deal with like, okay, if I, I want to publish, I think I'm supposed to publish a book. I remember thinking, I don't really feel a mess except when I think about publishing the book. Mm -hmm. And even the therapist I work with, she goes, you know, it is a choice not to publish the book. <laughs> and True. I thought, no, I feel like that's what I spent all these years writing it, you know, to get it out. So anyway, so I thought, no, I'm, I've, it's an intuition, right? I listened to those. So I was just a mess. And I actually kept working with her. And, I, and it wasn't just that I didn't want to be a big deal. I also noticed, I thought, I kind of am jonesing for it. There's some part of me I could tell, like, loved it. Like, ooh, I love to be famous. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't like that part of me. And it reminded me, because I'd been in 12-step meetings, although not for a substance, that mm -hmm. um, I thought, I'm like an addict. You know, being mm -hmm. special is like my drug. And so I kept struggling. And I ended up even not just, one, well, this is a little side story, but I kept pushing and trying to get past, like, how am I going to do this publishing thing? Because it's pushing all my buttons. And yet also, it's like I loathe it and I crave it. And I couldn't get anywhere I, and I was stuck. And I think even my therapist was like, you're just overthinking this and you know, you're not getting in touch with your feelings. And Familiar I, with that. Yeah, and I was fighting, you know, she, one time she said like, maybe you're just stuck. And I said, I don't get stuck. You know? And uh, so anyway, I, I got really sick and I woke up one night and this voice in my head was just like, stop, <laughs> just stop. And it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So it was well-timed because everything stopped. And so I just stepped away from the whole thing. This, Well, this, again, I have a lot of voices and intuitions and higher self speaking to me and things. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I even got a message that said, this is not your book. <laughs> but oh, wow. I think what it was is I was totally trying to control everything. You know, and, I, and, and anyone familiar with 12 Steps, so you surrender, you let go, yep. right? And I wasn't doing that. I was fighting. Like, I'm going to publish this book. But, and that's, it wasn't, I really felt like I was supposed to, but I was also pushing. And um, so anyway, I didn't have the trust. You know, it was like this place where I just abandoned all my spiritual principles. Hmm. So then I stepped back, and but I would keep thinking about it. And I couldn't get past it. And the thing I finally realized is I thought, I need to take myself out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And then when I decide, I thought I'll just be anonymous. And there's a book that was very popular. It's from the Netherlands called The Diary of Hendrik Groen. I don't know if I said that right. And the guy, he was anonymous. And not only that, he never would step into the public eye. He, I think the book hmm. became very popular. So he obviously somehow it got out. But he, um, I guess he won an award and he didn't even go to get it. <laughs> so, but I th so I thought it's theoretically one can just say no. And so that's what I did. I thought I just, hmm. I don't want a part of that. This book isn't about me. It's a book I wrote to help people, but it's not about me. Except, I mean, yeah. obviously it's about me, <laughs> but you know right. what I mean? In a literal yeah. sense. Writing yeah. the book isn't about me. It's just a right. book. Yeah. And so there are other obvious benefits, obviously, because I haven't, I don't, I'm not going to give it to my parents. Well, my father, right. I won't, can't read it now. So I feel better about that. Yeah. But yeah, I wouldn't, I don't ever tell like my family, like I wrote this book, you know, so being anonymous no, makes that. that a little bit easier, but really it's, a, I'm trying to stay away from the, and what I write in the website thing, cause I do it as journal entries also, but um, mm -hmm. there have been authors who became very successful and it's not like I'm going to be very successful, but I knew you never know, right? You never and, know. Yeah. So I was <laughs> like, I'm like, I have to account for that possibility. 
And I know Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. she hated all that stuff, hated it. And um, there was a woman who wrote, Mary Pfeiffer wrote uh, Reviving Ophelia. And then she wrote a whole mm, memoir okay. about how the success of that book practically destroyed her. Wow. Um, so I thought, you know, many times before I publish, I thought, oh, maybe I dodged a bullet, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so that was my, it's, I'm just opting out. You know, yeah. like, this isn't about me. I don't want to, I'm just, it's just a book. You can read it if you like it, fine. It doesn't work yeah. well for marketing, but you know, <laughs> that's just something I have to eke my way through. And it sounds like there are, you know, lots of ways in which you have changed from the girl that you were in the book, but uh, in many ways, you know, those, those triggers are still there. Yeah. I think the main difference is I can look at them. I can laugh at myself now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you're that going totally bonkers or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last question I have for you um, is about writing. Um, writing is obviously something that did at the time and does still bring you a lot of comfort. Um, can you just take a couple of minutes to talk to me and the listeners about writing as a form of therapy. I also, I ha I'm sitting right next to my pile of 15 journals <laughs> that I have had since I was, I, I've been journaling since I was 12, you know, and it's over the course of probably 15 journals. Um, sometimes I write more, sometimes I write less. So I'm very well acquainted with this, but I kind of want to hear your thoughts. Writing as therapy. Well, I think writing, in, well, writing for me is a place where there's no judgment. Um, and I get sometimes even, I, don't, I think writing is just a, my thing too. Mm -hmm. And when I was working on the book, I actually, I kind of literally fell in love with writing as an act. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Whereas before I just did it. But I think, well, for me, it was a place to, to look at what I actually thought. Like Ian e. Forrester, I think, because I've, I've read so many quotes about writing, but he goes, I write to find out what I think. And for mm, someone yes. who's, you know, has deep patterns of shutting down what they think almost before it comes out. It's a place where I can just write, you know, and let it out. And sometimes I write something and I go back to see what I thought after I wrote. So it's, I think it's a place where there's just absolutely total permission. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I love that writing to figure out what you think. That's why I write too. Yeah. And, you know, I wrote, um, I'm, working on another book of like, I guess, essays. And they're in the journal form. And something I realized too is I, for me, I just have to write in a journal because anything else I just get too affected. So I think writing is like the place where I'm like, you know, it's like, just be who you are. No pretense, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, don't worry about how it looks or how weird you are or anything. And so <laughs> I still need to do that because I, I have a yeah. lot of chat on myself. You know? yeah, I got it. I yeah. got it. So anyway, but yeah. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of people feel that way, right? It's. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a place where you can just be. It's like your own, yep. you know, room of yep. your own. Right. Yeah. For me, it's nature, writing and singing. Those are my, my churches yeah <laughs> my personal it's all churches. good stuff <laughs> well abby thank you so much for um your time today where really quickly let people know where they can find the book where they can find you well yeah so because anyway i have a very strange publishing route so far so the only <laughs> i actually make my own book as you know <laughs> um which i think is it's a coil bound book and so it's not on Amazon. I don't know if I'll ever be on Amazon, but so I have a website. It's well, the full site is HTTPS colon, you know, backslash backslash. Um, then uh, leaving perfect.com. And I sell the book through the website, although I give it away to a lot, you know, I'm just trying to get the book out right now. Yeah. So the only place if anyone wanted to read the book, that's pretty much the only place they can get it unless I decide to go digital. Yeah. Well, leavingperfect.com. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing today for your vulnerability. I know it's not always the easiest thing, especially when, you know, you're talking about 
um, the subjects that you're talking about. So I really appreciate it. And I hope that, um, you know, my listeners take something away at the very least, you know, knowing that they're not alone. All right. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. You have been listening to Wine, Dine, and 69. Check out the book, Leaving Perfect. I am your host, Rachel Dalton, and let's keep talking. Thank you.